I hear these questions over and over from buyers, either before we write an offer or when we're in the inspection. Because there are things you need to think about when you're buying a home in Phoenix that you probably don't have to think about wherever it is that you live right now. So I wanted to go over all of them just in case you don't call me to help you find your house. Although, why would you do that? We all know that it gets hot in the Phoenix area in the summertime. Well, there are a few things you need to consider. One is how the house is orientated. If your backyard faces west, then during the summertime, your house is going to get blasted with sun in the afternoons, which means you will likely close every one of your shades on that side of the house as soon as the sun starts to come into your house. And if you have a pool, then you might think, well, I'll just go jump in the pool so that I can cool off. Your pool will have likely been in the sun most of the day. And by the time we hit about mid-July, your pool temperature is likely gonna be anywhere from about 85 to 89 degrees maybe a little hotter, and it probably won't feel very refreshing. Now, I'm not gonna lie, it's going to feel better than sitting outside in 110 degree heat, but it's going to feel a little bit like bath water. When we talk about this, many people say, well, then I just want my house to face north, or I want it to face east. This is when it comes to personal preference, because if your backyard faces north, during the winter time, you're likely gonna have a mostly shaded backyard. And when you wanna go outside and enjoy that warm sun and that warmer weather, you might not have it in your backyard. And believe it or not, it might be too cold in your backyard in the winter time here. Yes, I said too cold. And if your backyard faces east, then that means the front of your house is gonna face west, meaning that your garage is probably gonna get blasted with sun as well as any other bedrooms or windows that you have on that west side of the house. Honestly, what I tell people is one of the best exposures that you can have is southern exposure because you're gonna have sun when you want it and you're gonna have some more shade when it's really, really sunny. But it really all does come down to personal preference because something that needs to be considered when we're talking about orientation is whether the home is gonna be your primary residence or a secondary home. I've had clients that are coming from the Midwest or Canada and all they want is I want sun in the backyard. All the time when I'm here, I want the most possible sun that I can get. And if they want a view and you're looking in Scottsdale, most of our homes here, they're going to have a Western exposure when they're looking down towards the city lights. And if they're only here during the winter, they don't really care if their house gets Western exposure during the summertime because they're not here. Which leads me to another thing when we're talking about weather and your house, and that's the windows. Now, most homes will have dual pane windows, but there are still some homes that will have single pane windows. And this, will have a big impact on your heating and your cooling bill. Some people that I know have actually changed their windows out to actually have triple pane windows, and that really helps to mitigate the heat in the summer and the cold in the winter. The windows are really just something to be aware of, and it is something that I look at every single time I'm looking at a home with my buyers, just to check it out. But then when it comes to the inspection, they're not only gonna look and see if they're double pane, single pane, or triple pane maybe, but also if any of the windows have failed. Now, this can sound really scary if you're not familiar with it. So let me just say this. A failed window does not mean that there's air coming in and out. It means that the seal between the double panes of glass has failed. This happens a lot here because of our heat. You will usually see fogging or some kind of like bubbles that it looks like between the panes of glass. That means you have a failed window. And what a failed window really means is that the R factor or the insulation factor of that window, that has been compromised. Now, the entire your window does not have to be replaced. They don't have to cut out stucco or anything like that. It is just merely the glass that needs to be replaced. Now, this can get expensive if there's multiple, multiple windows that need to be replaced. It's usually just a few, and they are usually the windows that take a beating from the sun. The other thing, it can all be fixed. Now, some homeowners add additional shade options to their windows. Some will tint their windows, but others will actually add those shades or those automatic awnings that go in and out to help kind of extend that patio and add extra shade so that the sun can't get in the house. The other thing that you might see on homes here that you don't have where you are are misting systems. This can drop the temperature pretty dramatically so that you can actually enjoy being outside during the summertime. If you are coming from someplace that is humid, misting system might seem a little strange to you, but remember, we have a dry heat here, so adding that moisture into the water actually cool us off. It is a fantastic thing to have. We have a misting system on our house, and I can tell you that it drops the temperature by 10 to 15 degrees during the hot, hot summer. And believe me, that 10 to 15 degrees can make all the difference in the world. Now, when it comes to the AC on the home, of course that's important. And here's what you need to know. When you enter into a contract, the seller is gonna tell you the age of their air conditioning unit. If the air conditioning unit is functional,
functional and 20 years old, they're not gonna replace it for you. During the inspection period, the inspector will look it all over. But if you feel like you want a licensed HVAC contractor to look it over so they really dive deep into that air conditioning unit, then I suggest you absolutely get one. If it's an older unit on the home but it has been maintained and serviced, it might be just fine. The biggest thing to know about these older systems is what is the Freon used? If the system is still running on R22 Freon, then that Freon is already being phased out and is very expensive to get. So at some point, you might have to replace your system altogether. There could be some alternatives to replacing that, but I haven't heard of anything yet. We have a system that fits this exact bill. We are keeping our eye very, very close on it. We get it serviced and maintained as often as we can just to make sure that it is in running order. But we also already know that we are going to have to replace it eventually. The reality is that overall maintenance and servicing of your HVAC units can make all the difference in the world. Something that people don't realize when they're moving here, especially if they're moving into the North Scottsdale area, is that we can get below freezing at night, which kind of shocks people. It's something they were never expecting. They kind of always thought that during the winter, our temperatures were like 70s and 80s, like all the time. Why is it important to know this? Well, for one, you might wanna cover your pipes. We do just as a precaution, but the other thing you need to do is you need to protect your plants. So it's important to know the plants that you have at your home because some really are not tolerant at all of that cold weather. So you'll see as you drive around some of those styrofoam cups on top of some of the cactus, people go, what's that about? That's to keep the cactus warm. Then as you drive around, if it's cold outside, you might see plants that are covered in burlap or something called a blanket. Yes, that is a blanket for a plant. If you don't do this for your plants, then they might freeze and not come back. Now, another question that I get asked a lot about is our water because we have very hard water here. Our water contains a very high level of minerals like calcium and magnesium. Some might think, well, why is this a big deal? Well, it can lead to scaling on plumbing fixtures and appliances and make it really hard on them. And it can lead to them breaking down more often and needing to be replaced. For this reason, many homeowners have a water softener or a whole house filtration system. If you put a water softener on your house, this is not the water that you would likely drink. Because of that, you will also likely find an RO system or a reverse osmosis system at the kitchen sink. This is where the water is filtered through about three to five different filters and then stored in a tank. And then you'll have your own little spigot right there at the kitchen sink so you'll have clean, fresh drinking water. If you have a whole house filtration system, then this might be something that is drinkable and would come through every one of your fixtures. From experience on our last house, we did not have a water softener on it. And in the 17 years that we lived there, we had to replace our kitchen faucet probably about three to four times. We have one on the home we're in now and we've been here for six years and we've never had to replace a fixture. The other thing that's nice is that if you've got glass shower doors, which many people do, having a water softener or a whole house filtration system is going to make it a lot easier to clean those surfaces. Now, some say that they don't like how the, the soap feels really slimy on their body if there's a water softener and they don't like how their hair is washed, it leaves it feeling limp. What my experience is, is if that's the feeling you're getting from a soft water system, you're probably adding too much salt. Because with ours, I don't feel that at all. I don't have any slimy feeling on my skin at all when I shower. Now in sticking with things on the house, I'm often asked about roofs here in Arizona. There are a couple types of roofs that we have. We have flat roofs and we have tiled roofs. Now, there are still asphalt shingle roofs here, but most people are aware of how to maintain those and what goes on with those. For the flat roofs, you will need to put a coat of elastomeric coating on that roof about every seven years. The big thing with roofs like this is that you do not want any tree droppings to be allowed to just sit on that elastomeric coating. It can break it down, cause soft spots, and really deteriorate the roof much more quickly. You also wanna make sure there's no significant bubbling or blistering of that elastomeric coating because those can pop and that's where the water gets in and that's where you can get a leak. For tile roofs, this question comes up because people think that when you have to replace that roof, like everything has to be replaced, but that's not true. To replace the tile roof, what happens is that they stack all the roof tiles. They then replace the underlayment paper. When they do that, they check all of the plywood boards underneath to make sure that there's no damage there. If there is, they replace the plywood. Then they put the paper back on, then they relay those tiles back out. Now they replace any of those roof tiles that have been broken that cannot be reused, but otherwise you can reuse all of those tiles. 
Now these roofs can last about 20 years or longer if they are cared for properly. But just like the flat roofs, it's very important that a lot of tree debris does not get left on the roofs for extended periods of time. That will really break down that paper. It's also important to keep trees trimmed away from the roof so that they don't displace any of those roof tiles with any heavy wind because it's the paper that has to be protected. And if that is exposed to water or sun, that's how it can get deteriorated and break down faster. A few additional things that you need to know about here in the Phoenix Scottsdale area is that we have flood zones, we have NAOSs, and we have fissures. The flood zones and the NAOSs are gonna be more in that North Scottsdale area. What does the flood zone mean to you if you're buying a house? Well, there are determined areas that are actually in flood zones. If you are getting a loan on your house, you will be required to have flood insurance. So you have to factor that into your budget. This is not everywhere in the North Scottsdale area or wherever there are flood zones, but we have a map that will tell us whether it's required or not. And it's something to be aware of. One of the questions I get all the time when we're talking about flood zones is, well, have you known of a house that's gotten flooded from any rain? And the answer to that is, no, I don't. However, you're still required to have it. Now, when you're talking about the NAOS areas, this is a natural area open space. And again, these are found more in the North Scottsdale area. Why is it important to know about these? Well, these are areas that have to be left undisturbed, even if they're on your property. So let's just say you buy a lot that is two acres. You don't actually have the full two acres to build your house and landscape on. There will be a designated amount of space on that two acres that has to be left as natural area open space and completely undisturbed. Now, people love this in this area because it adds space between the homes so you don't have wall against wall for your neighbor. This helps keep the desert continuing to look like the desert. Now, the fissures, these are more common in the Southeast Valley, and these are literally cracks in the earth. This happens due to excessive groundwater below the surface actually going away. Now, when builders buy plots of land that are in a known fissure area, they have to do extensive soil preparation and disclose this to any new home buyer. But if you are buying a home in a resale area, maybe the previous owner didn't know about the fissures, it leads to a point of possibly that not being disclosed to you. So again, just knowing where the likelihood of fissures happening is a good thing to know about depending on where you're looking for a home. Now, Phoenix's population is growing very quickly and has for the last two years, which we have all seen affect the housing market and it's now affecting the general feel of the city. Why? Because we've had more urbanization of the city to make room for more people. Now, this growth can lead to more crowded neighborhoods and an increase in traffic, but it can lead to more job opportunities and urban amenities. It's just really important for you to know where these locations are going so you can be aware of it depending on the neighborhoods you're looking at moving to because the neighborhood you love could change in the next few years based on some of the development that's coming. And with all the new people that have moved to the Phoenix area, it's important to know about all the airport noise. Now, the Sky Harbor Airport is our main major airport. However, we have multiple other airports all around the valley. We've got airport in Mesa that actually does take commercial flights and it is growing. We've got another one up in the North Phoenix area, Deer Valley. That one does not take commercial flights, but it is a busy airport. And then we have the Scottsdale Airport, which again does not take commercial flights, but it is a very busy private airport with planes coming in and out every day. And then on the other side of town, on the west side, we have Luke Air Force Base. This one has jets, so it is very important to know about this airport, especially if you don't like airport noise. Again, it is all things that you can live around, but it is just important to be aware of when you're making your buying decision. Now, if you would like to learn more about some of the best and the worst neighborhoods in Phoenix, make sure you take a look at this video. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.